Being in the digital age, we have all seen wildlife and nature images that moved us to our cores. The goal of some of these photos is to showcase the biodiversity of our planet, while others have a defined agenda. So what goes into creating these emotive images? And what is photography's role in conservation storytelling? Welcome to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Well-executed conservation photography goes beyond capturing beautiful images. When done properly, it sparks curiosity, shifts perspectives, and inspires action around biodiversity and habitat protection. Today's roundtable episode is a deep dive into the realm of conservation photography and how ethical photographers spotlight pressing issues through impactful visual storytelling. Joining me today are four talented photographers from the Canadian Conservation Photographers Collective. Josh Deline here, Chelsea Xavier Blauer, Ray Machen, and Donna Filiticic, PhD. Together, we discuss ethical photography practices, how to convey complex concepts through images, the power of giving a voice to overlooked species, AI in conservation media, leveraging photography's power for policy change, and the CCPC's most recent campaign, Crossing Paths. I'm thrilled to explore how photography and science intertwine to drive engagement on environmental issues and how powerful images further conservation beyond what words can express alone. So grab your cameras, fellow rewildologists, and head into the field with me to discuss ethical conservation photography with Josh, Chelsea, Ray, and Donna. Well, hi, everyone. I am so excited to be sitting down with you four amazing people for the show's first roundtable discussion. We are going to have so much fun today about one of my favorite topics, and that is conservation and wildlife photography in the ethical way, in the good way, in the impactful way. So I can't wait to dive deep into this. You're all professionals. You're the best at what you do. And I know you're going to give us so much education and knowledge to walk away from this. But first, let's introduce all of you to people listening. So I will just go around. If you all could say, I'll, I'll tell you who to go because that might get a little confusing. But if you could say your name, where you're based, and your particular photography expertise. So with those kinds of things, I think that'll really set up the picture of what you all do. So I will just go in the circle of my screen. So Ray, could you go first? Okay. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a photographer located in Delta, British Columbia. Um, I uh, got my Bachelor of Science from UBC and I uh, chose to uh, I focus on conservation biology and ended up with the uh, Painted Turtle program where we raise uh, turtles to be released into the wild. It's a threatened species. Um, so that's what I'm up to on the day to day. But um, I've obviously taken an interest in photography and I like to focus on uh, the smaller creatures uh, like the turtles and the frogs and things like that. I don't know if I have an actual area of expertise in photography, but I just kind of gravitate to whatever I can find out there whatever is in season so yeah that's about me and could you say your first and last name really fast oh did i not say that okay no. <laughs> my name is ray machin <laughs> awesome thank nailed you it. <laughs> nailed it nailed yeah. it awesome starting strong donna please go too <laughs> So I'm uh, Dr. Donna Fledicek. I'm located in uh, northern Alberta, Lac La Beche, a small rural community a couple hours north of Edmonton. I am really uh, focused on wildlife of the boreal forest, in particular in our area, conservation around the woodland caribou, which whose numbers have continued to decline continually, despite um, pretty extensive conservation measures. And so I use a lot of my photography to promote awareness about the woodland caribou and their numbers. I'm also very passionate though about owl photography and ethical owl photography. 
and um, and also just um, really carefully watching their numbers and the avian influenza and climate change and how it's um, impacting all populations in the northern part of Canada. Mm, beautiful, fantastic work. All right, Josh, you're up. Hi, Brooke, and thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Josh Deline here. I'm a conservation photographer based in Souk on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Uh, I've been a photographer for about five and a half years now, and I've really tried to develop my skills in a number of different areas. Uh, my focus is on a journalism aspect of conservation photography, so I want to be able to try and tell this story, the complete story of conservation issues. So I'm, I'm trying to practice not just uh, wildlife and nature photography, but also portrait and event and, and so on, uh, so that I can learn those skills to better convey uh, the message. Beautiful. And last but not least, Chelsea, please go. Thank you. Um, my name is Chelsea Xavier Blower, and I am a cinematographer and camera assistant slash video editor and obviously photographer too, based in Vancouver. Uh, I think I kind of gear more towards the video side of things these days. Um, and I, I particularly am interested in, not necessarily specialized, but have a fondness for the stories of the human and wildlife intersections. And so I like to find those kind of avenues of stories and yeah, shoot video, but I would say I also love and will always hold a passion for photography. And like Ray, I kind of just like go where, where the things are these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, to me, there's definitely a strong overlap between the two. I think a lot of things that go for one also apply to the other. Mm -hmm. So on that note, Josh, I want to ask you this first question. And I, I kind of want to start high level here so that we can so that we all know we're talking about the same thing. Do you, what is conservation photography and how is it different from other forms of photography, even like closely related genres, like wildlife photography, what makes it different? So I tend to think of conservation photography as a genre in which you are using your photography to promote conservation, awareness of, of issues. Uh, so it's not specific to one type of photography, as I mentioned earlier. You know, it could be anything from event and portrait and whatnot. But it's really the story behind the issues. Um, oftentimes that might be wildlife photography, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, you know, certainly landscape, uh, you know, on Vancouver Island, one of the uh, key conservation issues of concern is the old growth forest. Uh, so that might lead you into landscape photography in that respect. But throughout, I, I think the common theme throughout all of it is that you are, you're, again, you're using your photography to promote conservation and you're doing it in an ethical way, uh, which really leads into the discussion that we're having today. Awesome. Okay, Chelsea. So you talked a lot about wildlife filmmaking and I've, I, I actually really want to ask you this question. So like with the rise of wildlife filmmaking and the drive to capture more and more captivating shots, especially on social media, I've definitely seen this a lot. What steps do you take to ensure the welfare and safety of the animals you really photograph film while still getting those desired shots? So like, in other words, how do you maintain ethical wildlife photography practices in your work? Well, I think cool a lot of times where I'm ending up right now, I get opportunity to go in kind of remote areas or places where people don't usually go. So at this point, like I was in Brazil shooting for a, a documentary, different locations. And all the times that we've been there, we've had guides and fixers and incredibly knowledgeable people with us. And I think one of the main important things that people should always remember is a if you obviously aren't in a place where you can hire professional guides who have spent their most of their lives or careers understanding and studying these animals and aware of them is for you to take the time to also study that a little bit in your own for yourself whether that be just observing them don't even like don't go in with the mindset you're going to go take a picture just kind of like respect them watch them um or do your research online and like studies or just behavioral things you notice them because the more you do that the more obviously you are aware of when they're uncomfortable when you're getting too close um but yeah when you do have the opportunity to get guides uh, or to have guides you know listen to them they're there for a reason obviously you do your research and to make sure you're getting 
guides because they're for, like professional good guides that have good intentions and ethical regulations that they follow too. Um, yeah, and be respectful of it. And I think sometimes you have to accept that you're not going to get a shot because you're interrupting them or because, you know, like, yeah, set that boundary for yourself as well as the animals um, and, and sacrifice photos sometimes for the well-being of what you're shooting because at the end of the day, you might not be there for a long time. Maybe everyone's out there with photos and not caring about <laughs> where they're at. And I think also, like, it's the struggle of always like trying to share your location where you are because you know you want to raise awareness of these places and where you're going and these animals but you don't want to then bombard those places with people that then go which sometimes they don't really actually care about where they are they just want that instagram shot um so just recognizing when you go to places like the vulnerability that that it can have and you know thinking about do i really want like thousands of people to go to this spot versus Oh, like this is well managed. This is like managed by parks or by people that they can, they can then have that responsibility, not responsibility, but like monitor that and manage that. Yeah. I don't know, did I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was great. No, I would love, I would love an example. So like, let's say where I'm, I was just in Brazil. So I would like to let's say that we're there together and you are filming a particular behavior. How exactly would you approach that? We're getting into the boat. If we're, if we're, if this is the water-based version, if we're like in the Pantanal or something where I was, or if, or it could be land-based, but I guess for you, what are you paying attention to? How do you make sure that your actions stay in the ethical realm? And when do you know if they're being, if that line is being drawn or getting close to, Okay, without giving two specific examples. <laughs> um, I think like monitoring them, like watch, so, like we're filming a certain thing. Um, <laughs> I can watch this. Okay, for, like we're in the pantalon, for example, like you just said you were there too. I'm assuming you're filming Jaguars since that's what the main kind of thing is there. Um, just watching their behavior, like for example, if they're hunting and you notice behaviors that suddenly change, that just suddenly shift, you know, it's like gets agitated, it's like looking at you, like aware that you're there. But then like if it continues to do what it's doing normally, that's like one thing. But if it like looks at you and like you can see that it's because again, like I mean, they're all animals. You can you have that basic sense of like, oh, I don't think that animal is comfortable right now. Like it's acting different than it was a second ago. Just like watching those little things. And also uh, I know that it's like to do with like the particular animal itself but like being aware of like your surroundings and like where you are and like obviously like where you're stepping where your boat's going and um yeah and like the animals around you like a lot of the times in certain areas like listening to bird calls with like a good indication of what's around you um and monkey calls and stuff like that so just like aware of where you are and and yeah the the environment that you're in and making sure that you're not altering certain behaviors of the things that you're looking at and Again, like that comes with like practice of watching them and your guides. And this is where the guides come in really handy is listening to them. Like if they were like, because they, they, they teach you, they tell you like what, what's what's happening. They oftentimes they know a lot of these animals that they're watching individually sometimes. And they can tell you like, I think we're too close. We need to like get back a little bit, let it like do its thing. And um, just, yeah, being aware of what, of, of what you're recording and who you're with and your research that you hopefully did before you went there. <laughs> Chelsea, who was in charge of holding up the steak and going? Pss, pss, pss. <laughs> <laughs> they were. I will add to that, though. You know, like so, you're not always guided, though. And if you have guides, it's great. Like you know, grizzlies, jaguars, you know, Africa. Like frequently, you have to go with a guide. But it, and I think that's why it's critically important um, that you understand the wildlife behaviors. Lots. Of, I see lots of folks go out that don't understand the animal, but they're photographing them, and the animal is giving them all sorts of warning signs that they're not happy. You know, like most people don't realize that deer actually can make a sound when they're upset. People think of deer as being a really quiet animal, but they actually make quite the snorting noise when they're upset and um, give warning calls and things like that. So I, I think it's really important that if you're going to go out and want to really be involved in conservation wildlife uh, photography, that you under that you're studying the animals before you're going out in the field to photograph them, that you've done your kind of research and your homework. Um, because if it's your first time encountering that animal and you don't understand behaviors and there's no guide there to tell you, you can be causing the animal a lot of undue stress unnecessarily if you don't understand the behaviors. So 
Yeah. And like keep distance. Like I think so many places you're at, like they have clear indications of the distances you should be like polar bears and Churchill and like and Gracie's and animals and Yellowstone, for example. And like there's always most of the time set regulations of the distance and like respect that. Like it's there for a reason for their animal safety and obviously for your safety and that should always be a priority too. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yes. I think that the topic of ethical wildlife photography just isn't mentioned enough because we see these beautiful photos and it's, it's like, what's the line of getting that shot versus doing something that isn't what we would describe as ethical, you know, baiting or any kind of stuff. And of course that the question of baiting gets into a whole different discussion as well, like whether or not that's ethical and what do you do if you're going to a country where that is how they, that's like a tourist attraction. Like, what do you do? You know, do you still go? Like what happens when you show up and it's a bait station and you're like, uh, crap, I'm already here. You know, like those dilemmas for us as a uh, conservationist, first and foremost, you're like, do I still want to be here? Do I want to go? Or, um, one of the things that I, I always have an issue with that I sometimes, and sometimes it's a cultural thing too, just trying to get the animal to look for the photo, like a guide that's doing that kind of stuff, even like a pretty reputable guide in places I've been. And I'm just like, stop, what are you doing? Mm. Like, stop, <laughs> you know, like those kinds of noises and stuff. And so I wish it was just talked about more, like let animals be animals, you know, the shot itself is beautiful enough. Like you're there, you know? So I, I, that's why I want, I really wanted to bring this question up about this, the ethical wildlife photography. Cause mm. Again, you can't show a true conservation photo story unless you're actually taking photos of the thing that is, is as it is, right? So, yeah, did anyone else have anything about ethical wildlife photography? I think I might add to that, you know, when you talk about, I, I don't have a lot of experience photographing internationally, but I can certainly speak to photographing locally. And I think one of the things that uh, you need to be comfortable with doing is walking away sometimes. Uh, you know, environments, situations are dynamic. They can change. Uh, you may approach a, a situation and you observe it as it presents when you first arrive, but it could change over time. So just as a, at a local level, you might, uh, you might show up at a, at a, um, a location and find there's a, a large group of people surrounding the animal. That's not ideal for the animal's you know, benefit. It's too many people can cause it undue stress, disrupt its natural behaviors, that sort of thing. So I don't. I think sometimes it's best to walk away. Or if you're there shooting and a bunch of people show up, again, same situation. If 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 you're sorry, you're seeing those signs that the animal is becoming uncomfortable, that it's causing stress. Don't be afraid to leave, and don't be afraid to tell people that's why you're leaving. You know. You might not want to get into a situation, you know, a confrontation with other photographers, but you can certainly let people know that's why you're going. Oh, have you done that before? Mm -hmm. Have you been like, yeah, this is not a good, this is not a good situation. I'm out. Have you yeah. guys done? Oh, can I hear the stories? I want to hear jo the stories. Josh throws down. He's a, he's a big <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> do you throw some right hooks? Like, what do you do? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I, we... We've actually had this discussion, you know, amongst ourselves. Um, you know, we don't we don't do the name and shame approach. We don't, you know, we certainly don't do that online. It's it's really more leading by example, you know. So I think, but it's more about, like I say, letting people know. And I have I've had those conversations with other photographers and and said, you know, I avoid this area because it's I've, I've noticed that it's become too busy. There's there's too many people there, and, and I don't want to cause that. So. It's really more about having that discussion and, and raising awareness through conversation, I think, that in the long run is beneficial. Um, you know, my examples aren't, they're not wild and crazy. You know, I didn't, <laughs> it didn't break out into a fight, but certainly I've, I've left when I, when I uh, saw too many photographers. I mean, there are, there are popular local spots in them, and, and social media is really feeding into that because people unfortunately there are some people who will post the location and once that uh, becomes common knowledge it draws more and more people to it which you know as as chelsea mentioned is is one of the reasons why it's it's really important not to name a specific location to to give those animals the opportunity to be wild donna i saw you turn on your mic i'm sure i'm sure you have stories what are yours 
Uh, well, you know, Jasper during rut season has got to be one of the worst places to see terrible wildlife beha photography behavior. Um, oh, really? Uh, yeah, there's um, it. You can have 50, 60 people in a field watching two or three bull elk easily um, and stressing the elk significantly, like getting getting too close. Um, you know, I've seen the elk charge numerous photographers when I've been there. I can't tell you the amount of times I've left places in ja and Jasper and just said, I don't care. <laughs> going somewhere else this is this is craziness but uh i still keep going back because i mean it's uh i live in alberta it's a you know it is a really great place to get elk photos right and um but i try to find places where there's nobody at you know i go off some really beaten paths and you know if i come if i come in an area and there's a lot of photographers there i generally leave right i don't stick around because people just yeah silliness sometimes and then the other one story i did want to tell though which and again it goes to understanding behavior but um you know it's easy enough to see when an elk's getting upset or moose is getting upset i watched not too long ago a person chase a poor turtle around a field and the turtle had nowhere to go and and he's probably like your heart is probably breaking but I mean, I was we, gonna say we, that wasn't me, Donna. <laughs> no, but we get about get about two or three feet in front of the turtle, lay down, and click, 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 and so you see the turtle start to change direction, like go ninety degrees the other way. Get up, get ready for him again. <laughs> turtle would try to move, get up, get ready for him again. It was like, oh my gosh, the poor turtle. Yeah. Like let the poor thing alone. Like it was just, it was just bad. So, have you ever seen that with owls? I know that you are a pro at owl photography and. Owls I don't photograph owls. Love. I don't photograph owls of anybody, and I don't tell them where they're at. Oh, okay. so every owl photo I've ever taken, I've been by myself. <laughs> so, so nice. I mean, I'm up. I'm up in northern Alberta. So you know, it's not like I'm not in an urban center. Definitely, like you get in again in Alberta, Calgary, and Edmonton, and Great Horns in the city. And some of you will know, and all of a sudden, thirty people are there because it's on social media. Um, where I live, I live in the country and I go out and find owls in the country. It's usually just me and the owls. So, and the minute there's owls have very good tells when they're not happy with you. And the minute that they display any of those, I leave them alone. So. Nice. Nice. All right. Does anyone else have anything else about ethical photography before I move on? Yeah. I think I want to add one more thing to it. You know, I think it's important to note that it's it's an evolving field, um, that information continues to come out, and that what we think today might be you know a reasonable practice, we may learn in the future that that it's something that needs to change, and it's that's happened over the course of my brief career in photography, um, using calls for birds, particularly owls, uh, is now discouraged. And that was fairly common and still is amongst quite a few people. Um, but the Audubon Society came up with a really good article with uh, a number of reasons why it's discouraged now. Um, I, I think there are situations, and again, we've had these discussions amongst ourselves, um, where you may want to review something on a species-by-species species basis. There might be circum mitigating circumstances. It might be, you know, in relation, if you're out with a research team, for example, if it's scientific-based uh, work, there may be justifications for, for certain actions uh, that might not otherwise be considered reasonable. So, I mean, it, there is gray area for sure, but I think it's just good to be aware, generally speaking, of you know best practices and, and the most recent information that, that that I guess takes the animal's welfare first. It's really interesting that you bring that up because again, this goes back to my previous comment about even though some guides are great and a lot of international destinations I've been to, they'll use bird calls. Like I was in Costa Rica and Brazil and a lot of places. And I just like you said, it's like a cultural thing where I'm just like, I'm very much like, do not disturb their behavior. Like, I do not want us, just us being here is enough of, dis of a disturbance. Like, I don't want that extra level of changing whatever their behavior was. And, and I just, like you said, it, it seems to take a while to reach all of the conservation community around the world because these were respected guides. Like, I, they were amazing and super knowledgeable, but, you know, they got out the Merlin app and they were calling birds. And... 
then you're and then I me, I guess, as a as a trip leader, you know, you're in this weird spot, too, because I didn't want my guide to look bad because I wanted them to put their phone away, like stop. And then at the same time, the guests are going to get it's yeah, that that's an interesting place to be in as well. Like, I don't want to reprimand them for guiding the way they've always guided. Uh, but I would prefer there not to be any interference with their animals behavior. So that's a personal thing that I need to figure out myself, <laughs> but a very real thing. And I, so I'm really glad that you brought that up, especially bird calls. Well, I think when you get into, um, other, other places, especially, um, you know, outside of North America, it takes, you know, just, it just takes a while to, you know, change behavior. You can look at, you know, you're talking Brazil. And so an example there, um, you know, I was there recently too. And so where so much of the rainforest now is being cleared there for large ranches and farmers, those exact same large ranches and farmers are now the ones that are trying to bring a lot of it back in because there's, it's more lucrative for them to go into tourism, right? And to, and to use their lodges as places for tourists to come and stay. But the tourists want to see the wildlife. And the only way you're going to get that wildlife back is to restore the habitat and so it will it's going to take a while for sure i mean those those guides and you know um our guide was an excellent bird caller but by whistle he could he knew so many he could make so many bird call sounds it was unbelievable right but then he he takes a lot of clients like to go with him because he can call a lot of birds right and and so and and you know and that is financially look well not so much financially lucrative but i mean for him to even be able to support his family and stuff um where right. he lives and stuff you know that's that's his, he has to he has to get the clients right and so it's you know it, it's tough because you know it's it's really different circumstances there and I, I think it's just i think it's time i think it takes time um over time that um and they all although they'll like me but i think they will catch up so yeah yeah, that is a really fantastic point of like of where you are. I think that was also I wanted to make sure too, like the whole guiding thing, like like I, like and I'm recognizing that like we are yeah privileged enough to go to these places and mostly have the guides, but um recognizing that people can't do that, but there are also ways that they can do themselves and do their own research and like and their own ethics and ways that they can shoot too. Yeah, I wanted to acknowledge that too. <laughs> was like, white girl going to take photos? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's yeah, definitely a. That was a very good point, Donna. That's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. So let's make a little bit of a shift. So, Ray, it sounds like you and I have a similar background coming from the conservation biology world and then being in the conservation sphere and using photography as a tool. So I, I would love to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and as you've mentioned, thankfully, you told all of us that you, you love to tell the story of wildlife that's commonly left out of the conversation. So where do you feel photography fills that role, um, conservation of wildlife photography, and how can we leverage art to give voices to those that are commonly left out of the spotlight? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I've just basically followed what I've been interested in really. And meeting people like inside the collective and uh, folks and biologists within um, say the, the painted turtle program, um, it becomes pretty clear where the need uh, is needs to be like focused on. So if I want to get the message out about turtles, it, I mean, it's kind of a, an obvious solution in a way where I'm, I'm going to try to prioritize uh, taking photos of say the turtles I work with, their habitats and back to what Josh was talking about with definitions of conservation photography is not just make it like a pretty photo and it, like in a marketing sense, but try to tell the story, right? So show the individual, show the, show the, uh, the, the subject being photographed, try to make it artful if you can, because I mean, it's fun to do that and it's always good to challenge yourself, but also tell the story, right? So show their habitat, um, show the amazing people that are on the ground working uh, to restore habitat, uh, technicians in labs. We have an amazing vet in uh, Maple Ridge that's pretty much the only guy that we know that can can help uh, specifically reptiles, right? And 
we've brought so many turtles out to to him and his crew out there and that's always something awesome to include in the story so i think if you're focusing on lesser known subjects really go all in and show the full spectrum of the whole story right and uh, again thankfully meeting people like at the at the uh, the ccpc they can actually put a spotlight on the work that i can put out and share it with people that are only used to seeing like moose and polar bears you know sorry and is there a a ramble. A... <laughs> no that was not a ramble at all that was fantastic I, you can continue rambling that was, a <laughs> sure. ramble. That was great <laughs> is there a secret sauce that you have found because I, I just know that I, I'm personally partial to mammals and predators. I just am. It's just me. So how can, let's say, somebody like me or somebody who's not in the animal world at all, like they just like dogs, like mm -hmm. how can we make somebody that just loves dogs care about these rescued turtles? Are there any secrets that you found or I know you're talking about more of the story, but is there anything specific that you found that really gravitates with people or, or like, you know, resonates with people? Um, I, I found, especially with the turtles, um, it can kind of be a little easier to score those affectionate points when you're working with the threatened species. Right. So um, it, it, they face a variety of habitat challenges and things like that. So again, focusing on that story um, and just, just pointing them out, just honestly getting out those photos and those stories is I'll often get comments being like, I didn't know we had turtles in BC, you know, like just putting out the fact that they're around and it's, it really is an underrepresentation. People don't even know. They, they sometimes assume you're at the zoo taking these photos, you know? Um, and yeah, I, I just try to focus on those things that you can find under the leaves if you can, right. It's, it's fun in its own way. Like where a lot of us will look to the trees to find those cool owls and stuff, but there's so much more. Right. And these things are so just, they're so close to you, you know, they could be right next to you on a trail or under a log. Right. Um, and, and another amazing thing about animals like amphibians uh, and reptiles is they're amazing uh, bio indicators. So they can show the health of a local ecosystem. They can show, that your local park is thriving. If you're finding dead animals like that, you're finding dead fish, things like that in creeks, that could be the first, uh, the first indication that something is really wrong in that area, right? So they, they provide us intrinsic value, but they also provide us with uh, warning signs that affect all of us. That's so good. Yeah, that's yeah, that was fantastic. And I, I want to open it. I, I also kind of want to open that same question to all of you. Do you have a particular story or a, a project or a photo or something where you were trying to convince the public to care about this thing that the public probably doesn't either know about or doesn't care about? Is there anything like that that comes to mind? And, how, and what was your process? And I guess maybe what was the end result and... Yeah, I would, I would love to hear the whole thing. I can jump in on that. Um, so I have a particular love of pinnipeds. Pinnipeds being seals, sea lions. Um, I've always had an affection for them, but uh, since moving to the coast, I've discovered that a, there's a significant number of the local population that uh, harbors some animosity towards them. And it's largely based on misconceptions and myths uh, around those animals, so this this in this area, there's a there's a lot of recreational and sport fishermen, uh, and, and as well as commercial fishermen, and the belief amongst them is that pinnipeds are largely responsible for the decline of salmon in the area, and of course that impacts either their livelihoods or their recreation. <clears throat> so they, they, as I say, they they hold this animosity, but the reality is, the pinnipeds have or did recover uh, over quite a few years from near extermination on the west coast of, of North America. And so they had been hunted to near extinction. And only after protections were put in place did their numbers recover. And, and, but it happened to coincide at a time when salmon populations were declining. Uh, so people made that anecdotal assumption that pinnipeds were predominantly responsible for the decline of salmon. 
Unfortunately, it's not true. In, and while pinnipeds do eat salmon, uh, sea, harbor seals, for example, it's not their the primary source of their diet. They tend to eat actually smaller fish, uh, for the most part. It's it's only around uh, the times when, uh, typically in, in the spawning season, when there are more abundant salmon populations in the area, that seals will will chase them. Sea lions may be a different story, but uh, but again, overall, there is this belief that pinnipeds are, are, are bringing about the downfall of, of salmon. So I've spent quite a bit of time in conversation, but but also through my photography, trying to raise awareness, you know. And I, I first had to go and learn, you know, make sure that I wasn't making an assumption myself, you know, that the pinnipeds aren't actually the cause um, and that there are a number of causes for, for salmon decline. Everything from a chemical in tires uh, that was discovered by University of Washington State uh, that one single chemical was causing uh, a significant decline in, um, I believe, the birth rate, I want to say, of, of uh, salmon, you know, to factors like overfishing or global warming or uh, spawning habitat degradation is a real issue. Um, so there's there's a number of different factors that, uh, as well as uh, loss of feeder stock, uh, you know, species like anchovy and, and herring, herring in particular. Uh, so, you know, these, these sources of food for salmon have been depleted. So salmon populations truly are suffering. So I have to spend all this time trying to convince people it's not the, you know, it's not the seals and sea lions, not the pinnipeds. And the problem is that people will actively target and kill them. Um, you know, commercial fishermen, I, you know, there have been a number of examples where they have found uh, bodies or uh, around fish farms, aquatic fish farms. You know, again, you know, they they are naturally attracted to areas, you know, concentrated areas of fish. So not surprisingly, you know, they're, they're going to be drawn into those areas and in some cases actually get right into the pens. Uh, but yeah, it, they, they are actively targeted. So that subject... Uh, for me is you know, close to my heart and I do everything I can whenever I can uh, to try and change minds. Have you had a chance of like talking to any of these fishermen directly or the local community and yep. that were they receptive or not or? Yeah. I mean, they listen. Um, I, I hope over time uh, that, that, that information becomes more common knowledge. I mean, my, part of my concern is that there have been repeated calls for a cull of pinnipeds on the, on the West coast. Uh, there are groups that are actively seeking to allow that, which I'm trying to you know, to do my little part to discourage and dissuade, uh, from, from that ever proceeding. But yeah, at a, at a local level, certainly I've had conversations with a number of fishermen and they're sometimes resistant, but I think when I provide enough evidence, uh, generally speaking, they start to change their, their opinion. Yeah. Donna, do you want to go? You turn off your, you turn on your mic. <laughs> yeah. I just, well, I, I approach it. I have this exact same thing Josh experiences, I experience here with different species, but I, I approach it a little bit of a different way. And so so, you know, coyotes are viewed as the bane of everyone's existence. <laughs> if you live in, if you live anywhere rural, right? Coyotes, you know, you know, everyone will contend their calves were killed in the spring by the coyotes. And, you know, or you have chickens, if you have whatever, right? Or pigs or, or whatever. And, um, and, you know, coyotes don't really account for a lot of livestock mortality, um, but they're accused of it quite heavily where I live at. And they're viewed as a nuisance. They can be shot on sight. As kind of fox, as kind of black bear, they're all viewed as nuisance animals here. As are well, deer can't be shot on sight, but I can't I tell you the amount of people that think deer are a nuisance here too. And so, um, so what I really try to do is show that animals' vulnerability in my photography. And so, you know, coyotes, foxes are viewed as being very predatory here, um, but they're very vulnerable. And so, um, if you if you show a coyote mother with her three kits um you know in a in a close moment if, if you show um you know a, a fox back like fox kit or something i we have a local photography page like just for my community it's a really small community but i'll post these photos and then i can't tell you the amount of people that come up and go oh that fox was just so cute and then the next time they pick up that gun, are you going to, are you going to shoot that cute fox? Like, cause you know, cause I'm hoping that photo puts a lasting impression in their mind and they think twice about it because um, 
you know, we, we talked before about, you know, my passion for the boreal forest, but where I live, it's just so taken for granted, all the wildlife that are here, it's just so taken for granted. And so much of it is viewed as a nuisance if it gets in the way, like Joss was saying, of recreation, of industry, of, of whatever, right? And, um, and so I try to show them, I try to show, tell their story in a way that most people don't perceive them through imagery, so that people think twice before they decide that they need to be eradicated um, for whatever reason they think they need to be eradicated. So That's fantastic. We need more of that, especially for our nuisance predators in North America. I feel the exact same way. I'm pretty sure I recently moved back to my home state of Ohio, and I think that they're going, at least I was told of this, I need to look up the recent, that they might actually pass a bobcat season. I'm just like, what are you talking about? We don't have any predators as it is. And we might be having an open bobcat season? Shut up. So I just saw I, a post. I, I, I just saw a post somewhere about a bobcat competition where you cheat them and bring them in and win prizes for bobcats down in the States. Somewhere somebody, somebody had just posted that. I just, I could not believe it. Yeah. So I know they have them here for coyotes, the same thing, right? Like they, they Mm -hmm. were, they have those types of contests for coyotes, right? So. Sorry. Sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. Everybody. (laughs) It's like a little fun fact, but I, uh, I haven't, Done my own research in this, but one of the, my colleagues at work said, was reading a book. I want to remember the name of the book, but it was like saying that actually, like the way that the pack dynamics of coyotes is like not at all like the wolves. And when actually, when you kill a coyote, they're like, oh, we got to make more of them. So they actually like end up like trying to make more. So like it's just like the most mm-hmm. opposite strategy of like what they're trying to like to do. And like, yeah, you can listen to the scientists once again. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> well, most people and most people don't understand coyote behavior. Like a lot of people think coyotes are solitary and they're not. Their yeah. mate is usually within calling distance all the time, even when they mm-hmm. don't have have pups on the ground. And when they're not in mating season, they're always in proximity and they stay together. Right. And they raise their families and they and um, frequently even um, the younger pups from the previous year will stay much like wolves do and help raise the, the pups the next year and stuff, too. Right. And. And that and so you know it's um they're really misunderstood right and 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 when you take out you know in addition to what chelsea was saying about you know that they're going to try to populate even more but the loss to that family unit right people don't realize i mean people know it with wolves but they, they don't view coyotes that way at all right and but they are quite um connected mm-hmm. to the other coyotes in the region right so they're not they're not lone solitary animals so that people perceive like when you see them like yapping at each other they're like like who's there and they all like call her and they little happy sounds and i'm like oh we're missing bob where is he and then that's right yeah if you kill them you're just completely messing up that dynamic which you don't even know much about so i bet your coworker was either reading coyote america or american serengeti by dan flores it's probably the books that they were reading I mean, it was like um, blue cover and not that that makes any difference like a wolf on it or like a I don't even know. I have, uh, um, yeah, it's probably but, Coyote America. I, all my books are packed up right now. I'm actually ready to move, but it's probably that book that they were reading. It's this incredible behavior. It's like the one predator that the you know European settlers could not get rid of, and actually because of their behavior, it is now way more spread out than it was yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was not far east. It was not, and it was a lot of part where the coyote is now. It was not previously but Mm -hmm. because we tried to kill it we actually spread it (laughs) so good on you coyotes (laughs) the ecosystems they are doing okay too (laughs) Uh, yeah yes yeah and how much and how much did was it looney tunes ever help with wily coyote he was always so villainized that poor guy you know he should allow he should have won at least once or twice in that in that (laughs) you know i always was cheering for him (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, always like portrayed as stupid, which they are incredibly cunning and very intelligent. Yeah, and yeah, never can get a f- meal or food. Yeah, that's lovely. He, he well, he was so. he was cunning, but he always like it always backfired on him, right? He, he <laughs> yeah, was, literally. He really tried a lot too. Like he's not just working with his naturally. Like he's he's rigging dynamite and like <laughs> big like metal like anvils, and poor guy can catch a break. 
<laughs> He's industrious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's because the other outcome, if he won, is just a grisly murder of a small road runner, <laughs> which wasn't the greatest <laughs> thing to sell the kids, but I don't know. Well, his like scorched and charred body coming out under rocks. That's true. Like, yeah, he's pretty brutal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, fantastic. So, Donna, I definitely want to bring this next one to you. So, clearly, from this whole conversation, it's so obvious that you're a total expert in this field. You know, and observing wildlife and knowing animal encounters and behaviors and if they're comfortable or not. So. I kind of want to get back to the basics here. How did you develop the skill? Like, how did you hone the craft of being in the field, photographing wildlife? Like, you know, are there are there secrets, or how can we follow in your footsteps, essentially, to do this the right way? Uh, well, so I'm a researcher by training, and so I don't kind of just Google. <laughs> Um, you know, I, uh, I go, to, I go to scientific journals a lot and I don't know the average person wants to read through a lot of scientific journals, but when I'm really interested in a species, um, like woodland caribou, for example, the owl, uh, great growls or whatever, I, I spend the time to dig into the research on that animal to really understand them. Um, there's some great just reference books that are out there, like the behaviors of north um, north american wildlife behaviors i think it's called or something which is a great just intro but if i really want to understand like great gray owls for example you know i reached out to some you know some researchers whose whole body of research 20 or 30 years has been great gray owls to really understand what i was seeing where i was at and some of the concerns i had right and so so i say i spend the time doing my homework is, is really important. And then you got to spend the time in the field. You have to just sit and listen. And sometimes the best thing to do is not even have your camera with you and just sit and observe, right? When you have your camera, your your field of view goes from this, my hands are out wide because I know this is audio, to really, really narrow because because all you see is through your viewfinder and you're not aware of what's happening to the left or to the right or behind you or over here. And you don't know what that animals reacting to or seeing or sensing or whatever. So, um, you know, I tell folks the best thing to do is to actually spend the time in the field long before they take a camera out there with them and just sit and be quiet, right? Just sit and listen. And that's not for two minutes. That's like for two hours, <laughs> you know, the whole day, you know, under a tree and just watch, right? Um, uh, folks are always in such a hurry. I find, um, I, I can't tell you the a number of photographers I see that will come up to something oh there's a bull moose click 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 jump in the car gone <laughs> right it's just like okay uh, but watch the moose for a half an hour 45 minutes or an hour and see what he's doing and see where he goes and see how he's interacting um and whatever like um one of the reasons you know i when i i had done a session on ethical owl uh, uh, photography and one of the reasons i'm able to get good owl shots is because I know their behaviors though and I know where they're going to go like you, you know where they're moving to but you have to watch them a long time to understand that you know owls usually don't double back they they go they kind of work one direction at least the great grays work one direction down a field right they don't usually go down come back go down come back they, they work a field in one direction they take off with the wind right they land with the wind <laughs> you know those types of things and so um if you know that you can also be in a positions in the field so you're not running around like a lunatic trying to get the shot because <laughs> you kind of you kind of know where they're going to be at and, and how and how to get in front of them and know where they're going to go and if you know the area well enough you know like for moose for example like where we're at right now moose red sun i can literally walk out my door and they'll i can see a moose in two minutes right now but i also know the trails they are going to take right so i know where the trail is um off that field right and there's three places they're going to exit that field at so i'm not going to go and i'll go wait to where i know where the moose is going to come off the field at and wait there for an hour for the moose to come off the field right so um it's patience it's observation and it's research i would say are the are the big things so oh, yeah that's so good and i know that you traveled to we, we've touched on this a little bit but i would also like to hear how you approach if it's any different or for an international destination that you haven't been to before and if it's one that you may never go to again so 
there is that heightened pressure to get that shot or whatever it might be or tell that certain story. So what is your approach in those situations? So again, it's still research, right? So, you know, I was, I was just in Brazil. So, you know, um, like you were. And so obviously understanding the Jaguar is, is, is really, really important. But it's also, I think, to what Chelsea was saying, it's all about the guide when you get in those areas, right? You have to have guides that really, that are really good guides that really understand the animal's behavior and can educate you in the field. It doesn't matter how much I read about the Jaguar. I hadn't spent any time in the field with the Jaguar, right? And, and so, um, and it was unnerving. I actually wrote a, a post about just how unnerving it is because I, I said I would rather be nose to nose of a grizzly than nose to nose of a jaguar because I can probably predict the grizzly's behavior. I had no idea how the jaguar was going to behave though, right? So when you're, you know, you're on the Pantanal, so when you're floating down the real narrow tributaries and that jaguar could literally if wanted to jump on your boat, I'm not feeling too comfortable <laughs> back there because I don't, I don't know jaguar behavior. But but interesting enough, if you go to the Pantanal, you'll get in places where there's 10, 15 boats and 50, 60 people watching a Jaguar. And um, without, we were on this Jaguar the one time and it was just laying under the tree, you know, 38 degree weather, it's tired. It's just laying there, sleep, sleep, sleep. And then it gets up. So everyone's all, you know, all the cameras and 10 boats get up and it was click, 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 comes down to the edge of the water and it's just sitting there. And so then you hear, you know, Bob and Sue over here talking and Bill and Becky over here talking. Everyone's just talking. And I'm just watching this cat. And cats are still cats. You can see the cat. You can see it paunches and getting tense and stuff or whatever. And everyone's talk, talk, talk. And that cat just went boom and just leaped. I'm the only one who got the shot because I at least understood this cat's getting ready to pounce. Even though it's a jaguar, it's still getting ready to pounce and it still acts like a cat. And so just, I think too, just sometimes bringing your knowledge of other species that are similar to it and just paying attention to it, right? So that's the other thing too. But yeah, lots of research, lots of time in the field. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Which again, yeah, being in the field is, you can't really replace that knowledge. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like I said, cat's a cat is a cat, which I've said so many times. And I've seen many species around the world and I'm like, Cat is a cat is a cat. <laughs> uh, obviously, there are important differences, but it is amazing the similarities. You know, watching a lion sleep or hunt in the Serengeti is how similar it is to the same behavior of the jaguars, and it's just in the Pantanal. It's amazing. Um, the jaguar likes but to again, swim. I don't different. know how many cats like to swim, but the jaguar. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. So this next question, I wanted to just to throw all to all of you um, and whoever wants to answer it can if you have a strong opinion or you don't. So right now, AI is all the rage. Everything is AI. AI won't go away. Well, it's not going to go away. But now it's really starting to infiltrate the visual media sphere you know, now it's getting to the point where we don't even know if something we're seeing on Instagram was made or enhanced by AI or whatever. So do any of you have a strong opinion on this? Like, do you, um, does AI fit into conservation photography's mission or does it not? What do you all think? I'll jump in there. Um, so I, I think with, uh, with any photography, I think transparency is key, uh, particularly as it relates to conservation photography. You know, I think I, I don't like the idea of, of deliberately manipulating situations, and that's something that we're mindful of in our own photography. Um, you know, it, it's it's important that what you show is accurately portraying the reality for you know for whether it's an animal or for nature, natural environment, you know, habitat. That sort of thing. So I, I'm not particularly fond in that respect. If for some reason you were to use an AI image to demonstrate a point, then I think what you need to do is is be transparent and say, you know, this is what it, the point that I'm trying to make here is this. This is an AI image, a, you know, AI generated image. Um, but yeah, I think transparency is really key to all of it. Have any of the rest of you ha encountered AI in? your line of work or had any issues with it or 
but any sort sort of future thing or if you're nerded out on AI tech or something like I'm very indifferent to this right now because I don't I'm it's still so early to me but I know that some people have really strong opinions and so that's why I wanted to ask all of you I think that's uh, a bit of a uh an anxious topic as well as I think a lot of us don't even know in some cases it could have, we could have come across some very manipulated images and these programs are getting very good, you know, but uh, I think back to what Josh said, uh, especially in conservation photography, transparency is the most important thing. Like, especially if you want to put out a message or a campaign or anything like that, that is demonstrating there's an issue with this habitat or this wildlife. And um, it turns out that if the images you put out there to show the issue are totally from a program and not even real, that that could probably really hurt your cause, you know? So uh, in the is issues of, in like uh, instances of competitions too, and things like um, when you want to demonstrate an honest situation that, it seems like you either have to not use something like that or be very honest about it. Cause that could really, really hurt your cause more than help it, honestly. And I think it can hurt the credibility of the photographer, but um, the flip side of it is AI is not going away. Like it's, it, it is, it's part of our, it's part of our culture now. And, and I think one of the things is not so much should you or shouldn't you, but how, right is i think the question is gonna be more how than should you or shouldn't you like how should it be used and when should it be used kind of what josh was talking to i don't know that people are there yet obviously you know it's kind of like you know i'm in the education field you know chat gbt it's <laughs> you know the big thing on student papers and stuff you know the you know the big faculty lose their mind on that um but it but it's not going anywhere you know somebody gave me the analogy the one day is kind of like the calculator in math like it didn't go away we just learned how to incorporate it in mathematics right so how do you, how do you incorporate AI into into what we do and and I I think though eventually there'll be opportunities to use in a ways where it's fully disclosed that this is generated by AI but to tell a story that you can otherwise tell without harming the animal to get that story right so if if us going into a certain spot is really um, impactful on the habitat of that animal like sometimes you know just walking on things or whatever is really you know can be really uh, devastating to s small you know microorganisms fungi and stuff or whatever from um, microcosms and, and things like that then i think the way you tell the story is through ai but you say that it's ai generated and so i think it i think it can help in the future but i, I think we just have to get past that it's here first and then really have some really conversations in, in the profession about but what does that mean and how do we use it in a way that's effective and impactful and not deceiving and misleading, right? I think is where the conversation eventually needs to move to. I think it's important to note too that, you know, AI isn't limited obviously to image generation, but text, of course. Um, and if someone's going to use text to help, uh, you know, AI, sorry, to generate text to help illustrate an issue, I think it's important to do some fact checking. Uh, particularly at this stage in the game where there's there's a lot of um, errors that are being found in in the information that's being generated and that again going you know going back to the point of of um, harming your credibility uh, in setting you back you know if it's going to be more harmful to your ultimate goal then it may not be worth using or at the very least making sure that you're reading through that material and verifying that the information that's contained within it is factual. Yeah, those are fantastic points. And I really love how you just brought that up, Donna, about the possibility of being able to use AI tech to possibly um, film or photograph areas that we shouldn't go. Like that's that could be really powerful. I was thinking about this amazing guest I had on. Her name is Debbie Saunders, Dr. Debbie Saunders, and she's the um, founder of Wildlife Drones in Australia. And I don't quite know exactly how their tech works because I way over my head, but they have technology that will find and track wildlife using trackers and these crazy areas and these crazy places. And it's like this most revolutionary type of tracking that we have. And they're able to track these species that are super endangered that we would never be able to find otherwise. And so 
And I am partnered in my professional work with using AI technology to, uh, you know, locate individuals, like, like identify specific individuals of pattern individuals in photos. So yeah, if used the right way, there is a lot of good, you know, and just as long, hopefully we'll also have the tools to know when it's not real. I think that's my biggest, like my biggest concern, like, will we be able to, will our, how strong will our bullshit meter be? It's like, you know, like, how can we, how can we tune that bitch up? Because I need a strong bullshit meter because <laughs> that's my biggest concern. Um, just because these stories are so delicate and I, I just don't want anything like that to hurt what our mission is, you know? So. I think just going back to, you know, a, a point that we discussed previously, um, the, the issues with the A are not necessarily exclusive to AI. You know, some of those problems exist already uh, where images can be misrepresented. Uh, you know, that that already happens now. And it's something that we as photographers need to be mindful of. So again, that transparency, doing the research, making sure that what you're saying, what you're portraying is an accurate reflection of what it is that is happening in uh, within that image. Yeah, um, I think I told you guys in the last time we sat down, but... I submitted an image that has made it to a final round of this pretty big global wildlife photo contest. And I had to submit the raw image to prove it wasn't AI. I was like, this is new. Well, and that kind of is what spurred this whole thought process. I was like, wow, I have to show like, like with data that this isn't AI. Like, wow. <laughs> this is, I have entered 2023. Okay. We're here. <laughs> I think it's good though, because it does show that we're already like looking for ways to Make sure that people are being correct. Like again, like photo ablation has been around for ages. Like we've already been doing this in like a lot of photo contests and a lot of things. And I think it's like a new scary thing. But again, I think it can be used for some good. Like not necessarily just like in our world, but in a lot of different areas. And like like a one example, like similar to Donna's, like, you know, you can like be like, this is a forest that no longer exists, but look what it could have been like. And like use just like things like that. Like it doesn't have to be this big scary thing and a lot of the problems that we're facing with it have already been here have been around and we've faced them and we we are facing them so i think yeah i don't think we need to be so scared about it but maybe we do but have you actually heard uh since you're in, you're in the film world and i'm not as in touch with that world have you actually seen any examples of ai being used in like wildlife film i probably haven't um mm. no not that i've like clean but i mean i'm sure it exists but i i haven't seen any yet even like on like editing things and software i haven't come across anything in particular but i mean it's gonna probably come like it's just a matter of time but um i mean like like cgi and all that kind of stuff is kind of like on that realm like you know they just like bbc or someone i don't know who it is but they just uh released that like dinosaur thing and it's like winning a bunch oh yeah bbc of, like, yeah we see and like so that that kind of stuff like i grew up with like everyone grew up with watching that kind of stuff so i think in the film art it's, it's been around it's just called something different than I, yeah. I grew up in silent film and black and white so cg yeah no sorry yeah. Chelsea, I, I can't relate sorry <laughs> <laughs> the little <laughs> dinosaurs when i was younger <laughs> but i mean like yeah it's progressed and i think it's the same thing of like people are just scared of progression but it can come with a lot of good too it's just a matter of how you handle it and recognizing when it's truthful or not which I think we're already doing. Like you just said in the submitting photos and they're asking for things. So it's kind of a good sign. Yeah. Yeah. I love hope. I love hearing all the hope. That makes me feel, cool. <laughs> makes me feel so good. So Josh, I want to talk to you for a second. So let's, let's bring this whole conversation around and put it in a pretty bow. So I want to discuss a real life example and maybe this is the perfect time to talk about why this group of you amazing people are even here. Like teach us about the CCPC, your group's mission, and then what is the most recent campaign? How does it bring together all of these aspects that we've talked about and what you're currently working on right now, all of you are an amazing part of it. Thank you for asking. So the Canadian Conservation Photographers Collective uh, officially launched in October of 2021. So we've been around for a couple of years now. Um, we started with 19 and have grown to 35 photographers that are based all across Canada. 
not all of our photographers uh, were born in Canada. Some are, are um, you know, have joined us from other parts of the world, but but all of them are, are based in Canada. Um, our mission is to. It's really about education, about informing people about conservation issues, using our visual content to to uh, carry that message. Uh, so we're you know we're hoping to educate, engage, and inspire meaningful action through our work. Um, We've done it in a number of different ways. You know, we're we're still growing. Uh, we're not yet an incorporate, uh, incorporated nonprofit, but that's something that uh, I'm hoping will happen within the next year. Uh, but we've uh, yeah we've engaged in a number of different things. So obviously, we started out uh, small on social media, and then we've got a website. Uh, but you know that that has grown gradually over time. Our website is expanded quite a bit recently with our campaign. Uh, so the focus of that particular campaign, which is called Crossing Paths, the Impacts of Transportation on Wildlife, we wanted to look at uh, different aspects of transportation in Canada that impact wildlife in various different ways. So we, we chose five themes, which are roads and highways, railways, lakes and rivers, aviation and oceans, uh, because all of those uh, various methods of transportation exist within Canada and, and are prevalent from coast to coast, uh, to, to, from all three coasts, I should say. Um, so our photographers started shooting in June. Uh, they had until the end of September to gather and submit their images. And we also have a volunteer team that has done a tremendous amount of work uh, in preparation for the launch of our campaign. So our campaign officially launched on November 1st and throughout the month we're going to be uh, sharing information uh, that we've gathered through research, through interviews with experts and from uh, partnering organizations that uh, have provided a tremendous amount of expertise and who are experts in some of those particular fields. So our three partners for the organization are the Marine Education and Research Society, Living Lakes Canada and the Wildlife Collision Prevention Program. Uh, their focus is on the ocean, uh, on lakes, obviously, and on uh, roads and highways, uh, you know, trying to minimize and mitigate uh, risks to wildlife uh, from, from collisions and accidents. So it's it's been a tremendous amount of work. We, as I've said, we, um, we've populated our website. So we have a campaign page on our website that branches off into those different themes where you can read uh, the, the material that we've researched. You can see the images that we've pulled together, both from our photographers and from our audience. Uh, so, you know, some of our followers on, on Instagram or social media feed submitted images to us, uh, which was phenomenal. It helped supplement uh, the images that we had. Uh, we pulled together video that our photographers had in their you know, existing banks, as well as when it was shot. And, and I have to really uh, you know, take a moment to, to, to thank this crew here, uh, you know, who, who were actively shooting for this campaign and throughout it. Um, uh, but, you know, certainly all of the photographers. So, yeah, that's, that's uh, it in a nutshell, I guess. I guess. Um, so what, can, I, what's, can I add what's something, it? though, that I think was important, though, that Josh didn't mention? So in, in terms of just talking about the issue, though, um, the campaign also gives solutions to the issues, which I think is important because lots of times we talk about the issues, but we don't talk about the solutions to the issues. And so there's solutions there from, um, they interviewed a, Josh did a phenomenal job and a couple of folks like later on went out and interviewed experts and, and got, you know, and talked about the issues and what they were and, and got, you know, this is, but this is what we could be doing. And these are things that you could be doing. Just average Joe Blow can be doing, right? And so, and I think that's a really critical piece of the of campaign. Sorry, Josh, I miss your campaign, but I thought it was important to mention those. So. It's it's our campaign, and no, that's thank you, Don. I, re I really appreciate. It. I I, I uh, don't always catch everything there, but um, yeah, no, that's that is a, a really important part of what we did there. So, um, from an impact standpoint, what are you hoping will happen once the campaign is? launched and and move forward is there like an end date or i guess yeah what's what's the future of what you've done with this so we're i mean we're trying to measure our success uh, through various means and actually chelsea was the one that uh, really helped sort of guide that uh, that discussion around uh, me measuring the success of, of the campaign um we're you know we're tracking obviously um response to activity through our social media feeds like that. Um, but we also want to to 
follow along with our partners to see how many people are, you know, among of our audience are going out to them, making donations or, or getting involved in projects or, you know, in some way contributing to the work that they're doing because they're the experts in these particular fields. We want to guide our audience, you know, give them that information then give them an opportunity to support organizations that are actively, actively involved in this work, um, but also giving them opportunities, you know, in, in, among the solutions that we've suggested, there are things that people can do on their own, uh, certainly to help address and, and mitigate some of these risks. And what was the inspiration for this first one? Why did you decide, of all the conservation issues that you could have chosen, why this one? Personally, it, it actually started with a com uh, conversation with one of our photographers about a year and a half ago, a little over a year ago. Uh, my wife and I were traveling through the uh, Rocky Mountains and we stopped in Canmore and we met with one of the photographers. So one of the, you know, nice things is because we're, we're distributed across the country, it's, it's not always get, you know, easy to get together. Um, but when we do travel, sometimes you get to actually uh, meet in person. So one of the photographers, Abdullah Musa, we met in a, a cafe and we were discussing just photography in general. And he showed us some uh, images of, the, of gri uh, grizzly bear that he had photographed on railroad tracks. And he explained the issue behind it and, and how uh, these trains, as they're carrying grain west from the prairies, they're shedding this grain onto the tracks, which attracts animals, uh, which then get killed. So he had taken these amazing photos and I thought that's, that's really interesting. You know, it's, it's something that I hadn't considered, something that I wasn't necessarily aware of. And I thought, man, that, that would be a great topic. So I, I, you know, personally I had that in the back of my head, but you know, we're, we're a democratic organization. So when we make decisions, we do it together. Um, and we, we throw out some different ideas and this was the topic that everybody chose to tackle first. And it's something that we can do visually. You know, I think that's really important whenever we're considering, you know, campaign. There are great subjects, uh, you know, conservation subjects that should need to be covered. But it doesn't always mean that there's something that, that are easy to, uh, to photograph and, and tell that story. Um, this, this was one, absolutely. And now I have to ask, what did everybody contribute? What was your, what was your moment or the, the scene? Ray, what was yours? I want to, I'll ask Ray, everybody. You, you might you might be able to guess, <laughs> but uh, they were little green creatures most of the time. Um, I had I, I've come across a lot of obviously like turtles even in the wild, and uh, that's a really big problem for reptiles is getting crushed on the road. So that was a majority of my contribution. Is uh, fortunately a few reptile and amphibian corpses. Um, reptiles are cold-blooded so they want to warm up and that those sunlight and and unfortunately paved roads are perfect for that so uh there's a lot of turtle mortality i'd like to see in areas where there's more of that type of traffic more signage and things like that uh hopefully as a result of a campaign like this a lot of dead snakes um a local conservancy they're called the fraser valley conservancy they do a lot of great work during uh seasons where uh the baby western toad toadlets will be crossing the roads in droves there'll be little black pebbles by the thousands just going all over and unfortunately they're getting crushed by the hundreds and it, it's awful so uh they've done amazing work to make little underground tunnels they have fencing that'll redirect them um and you know we, getting back to the overall campaign we, you know we we include footage and uh uh, we support the ideas of, say, wildlife overpasses, right? So alternatives to where animals might not be hit on the road. Um, and that extends to the rivers and the oceans as well, that there's there's hopefully solutions to these issues, right? So, but to back to what you actually asked me, <laughs> yeah, mostly like little creatures, uh, like ro roadside animals of uh, like what I like to focus on the reptiles and amphibians is what I contributed. Mm. He's leaving that out the fantastic. fact that he, he also uh, dropped at a moment's notice and ran off to uh, conduct one of the interviews with one of our uh, experts. So, you know, that, that was very much appreciated. We had a, a short window of opportunity and, and Ray uh, stood up. Yeah, it was around the corner. It looked pretty bad if I didn't do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> uh, gotta keep that good reputation going, I understand. Yeah, gotta, gotta really contribute to a fearless leader. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, Donna, what was yours? What was the whole story behind the images you submitted? Um, well, um, trying to get access to an airport is not easy, but I'm fortunate that my husband is the trans is the uh, transportation foreman here and, is the air and looks after the airport where we live in our small town. So it allowed me, you know, to be able to be out at the airport and get uh, photos uh, because, you know, airport access is not that easy. So, um, and then just some of the, and some of the equipment that they use, uh, mostly birds, right? But to, you know, like the scare guns and, you know, predator kites and things like that to try to discourage the gulls and um, other birds, ravens and stuff from being on the tarmac and um, so that the, you know, they don't have planes being hit. So, um, so that was the majority of what I contribute is, um, and I, some rail stuff as well too, because I'm in Jasper quite frequently and trains are pretty plentiful going through Jasper and elk like to stand on those tracks a lot <laughs> as do bears and other and other animals as well too so those are mostly what I contributed to the campaign oh, beautiful Chelsea what were yours yeah, I was naughty and I haven't submitted any yet <laughs> <laughs> it's been a busy summer okay I was like in the field I cannot go and shoot them but I do I just realized Josh I haven't seen the photos that I said I had oh my God. <laughs> I came back from when I was gonna submit them, and I do still want them. I have them, but uh, they were up. Um, um, Birds of prey. I was in like a. It was like a while ago, but it was the first time I actually like learned about it. But um, they were. I was in like the sanctuary, and these it had an owl and some bald eagles, and they had all been hit by cars. And basically, when you throw out your apple cause or any like biological matter you're like oh it'll it'll like disintegrate and i've done this before before this i was like yeah sure but it actually tracks old rodents and it tracks things that come and eat that which then further attract birds of prey and so that was an interesting little neat thing that i learned that i have not submitted my photos for yet I, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, Chelsea's um, circumstances this summer reflect, you know, that of a number of our photographers. And the reality is, uh, like Chelsea, who is a freelance uh, videographer, you know, many of our photographers are working professionally. Uh, so if they're on contract, if they're on assignment or whatever the case may be, you know, they didn't necessarily have those opportunities. It, it really varies by people's life circumstances, uh, you know, their availability and opportunity to to contribute to to one specific you know project um but certainly over time chelsea absolutely has and, and has contributed some beautiful imagery and videography so you know, we're very grateful for the work that she does as oh he's too nice he's too nice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's saving my i have no life so i can go out and photograph whenever, so. <laughs> wait so you're letting her off the hook <laughs> where's where's the where's the accountability <laughs> we'll talk about it later, right? Yeah. <laughs> we'll discuss this later. <laughs> He's like, the record button's still on. Yeah. We can't have this live. You know, we'll air in a, in a, a yeah. file. Pop That's <laughs> right. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, <man. laughs> Wonderful. Well, I love to wrap up these amazing conversations with probably... It's, it is always one of my favorite favorite questions because I never, ever know what somebody is going to say. And if any of you have a piece of advice or a message that you would like to give to those listening, if it could be one thing that somebody walked away with, what would that be? And any of you can go. Or I could go in a circle. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say some some in terms of conservation and photography, sometimes the best photos you take are the ones sometimes the best images are the ones you never take that are in your head. Because you did the right thing and you walked away from the situation and you didn't stress the animal. Um, but you have the memory of it. Nobody else is gonna see it but you, it's in your head, but sometimes those are those are the best. Okay, mine's like a cheesy, cheesy yeah. one. Like <laughs> Like, as a, from a career standpoint, like, if it's, like, something that you're going into as a career to make money off of, A, it's freaking hard, and B, um, 
I think like, I don't know, growing up or like, not growing up, but like throughout, throughout my career, it's always been this constant, like you compare yourself and like your timeline to your colleagues and it's like, oh shit, like they're only doing that and I'm doing that. And it's like, I mean, it's still like a work in progress for me, but I say this a lot, like you're on your own time. It was like, there's no race. There's no where to get to. Like, don't like, I've met people now that have like started this career, like in their like mid thirties or like forties. And they're like, you know, now like camera operators and it's like, oh, thank God. Like, cause they just like built with this, like idea that you have to start like young and you have to like reach certain milestones as your age. And I think it's just so stupid. And um, yeah, and just, just have confidence in yourself and stop comparing your stuff to others and yeah cheesy one I told you <laughs> no that's really I good that's part, yeah. a great reminder holds a lot of people back including myself so I'm trying to speak my own words and like no go by my own words that's the word <laughs> yeah so it's still time is what you're saying <laughs> yes <laughs> you're never too old to start either though because I didn't really get into it until just about 50 years of age so so yeah, yeah. so yeah don't be held back by your age young oh, or old 100%, 100%. Mm -hmm. Ray did you have anything any last uh words? they've been you guys have been putting it really well cheesy or not I think you put it pretty great um but Mm, I guess maybe to take a page from the turtles, you know, you can go slow. Sometimes you can take in everything that you want to see, right? Um, you don't have to rush to your next destination. Uh, the next amazing uh, photogra photograph opportunity or conservation story could be where you least expect it. That was pretty cheesy itself, but that's all. <laughs> awesome. That was easier than mine, but it was still. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll uh, I'll jump in with my last thoughts. So I I didn't mention it today, but I often say this. Um, you know, I'm a conservationist who picked up a camera, um, and and I did it specifically to to tell conservation stories. You know, I would say to anyone who's passionate about conservation that this really is a great way to uh, you know to to get involved in, and and help share that message. And it's the experiences you have along the way are phenomenal. You know, spending time in nature, you know, around the things that you truly love. I, I, I don't, I can't think of a better way to connect with it. And when you leave, that subject is still intact and still unharmed. And, you know, you, you've witnessed it in its natural environment and you can walk away and have those memories and have beautiful images uh, that you can, you can share, but also that you can treasure. Mm. That is so good. And I, could not agree more. I, I have, I was exact same way. It was a, like a very similar to Ray. It was a conservation biologist that happened to pick up a camera and I'm like, wow, what better way to just show the beauty of this world than with this lens and this mirror thing that I have. And I don't know what's an ISO. I have no freaking idea, but we will <laughs> figure this out. Should I just start an auto? Okay, great. Um, we'll start there, it? but <laughs> I've never quite figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to sit down with me, to sit down with everybody and let us see behind the lens. What is it actually like to be a conservation photographer and have impact with images and also with our words? So Thank you all so much. I can't wait to share this with everybody. It was awesome. Thank, Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Brooke. Thank you for joining me on this wild adventure today. I hope you've been inspired by the incredible stories, insights, and knowledge shared in this episode. To learn more about what you heard, be sure to check out the show notes at rewildology.com. If you enjoyed today's conversation and want to stay connected with the Rewildology community, hit that subscribe button and rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. I read every comment left across the show's platforms and your feedback truly does mean the world to me. Also, please follow the show on your favorite social media app, join the Rewildology's Facebook group, and sign up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter. In the newsletter, I share recent episodes, the latest conservation news, opportunities from across the field, 
and updates from past guests. If you're feeling inspired and would like to make a financial contribution to the show, head on over to rewildology.com and donate directly to the show through PayPal or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. Remember, rewilding isn't just a concept, it's a call to action. Whether it's supporting a local conservation project, reducing your own impact, or simply sharing the knowledge you've gained today, you have the power to make a difference. A big thank you to the guests that come onto the show and share their knowledge with all of us, and to all of you, Rewildology listeners, for making the show everything it is today. This is Brooke signing off. Remember, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>